afternoon. I'm Pat Dean. I'm the Associate Director of the Journalism School, and I'm looking around, and I think everybody knows who I am. Um, Geneva had to attend a, a funeral, and um, so um, she will not be with us, but she is here in spirit. This is something that she set up some time ago. With Dory Maynard, and I'm, I told Dory that um, I'm going to err on the side of a very brief introduction. Uh, for those of you that don't know a lot about you, I, about her, I encourage you to Google. She is a uh, journalist and a passionate advocate for the right kind of journalism that brings in all voices. She's a person in her own standing, but the Maynard Institute was founded by her parents. And uh, she will probably talk a little bit about that. And the vision of the Maynards has been so important to journalists and has made such a difference in the profession and in bringing voices to the stories. I look out, I see all our students who, you know, when you start here, we say you start, you're starting your career in journalism. To the faculty here, most of us can look back and say that the passion the Mainers brought had an impact on our careers, how we looked at reporting, and I think made us all stronger reporters. And we came across the articles they wrote, the workshops they did, and the work of the Maynard Institute. Um, just a little note, you are welcome to tweet or to follow Bill, who will be tweeting on the Annenberg site and um, um, get the word out about some of the very important things we're going to discuss for the next hour. Please feel comfortable asking questions, participating. It is my honor to introduce Lori Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the Mayor Institute was founded, um, my parents were co-founders in 1977, but it was founded by nine working journalists, and I am humbled to be in the presence of one of our founders, Frank Sotomayor. And when the Institute was founded, and Frank, please correct me if I get anything wrong, uh, it was founded to get entry-level journalists of color into the industry. It was at a time when uh, the founders, I think, heard repeatedly, we would like to hire people of color, we just can't find any qualified. And so they got together and created an 11 week boot camp that has trained journalists that include the uh, national editor of the Washington Post, the only Latina to uh, edit a major metropolitan newspaper, and Pulitzer Prize winners across the country. But I think as the, as the industry evolved, the institute evolved, the founders came to realize that if you really wanted to change journalism, you needed to start training decision makers. And so we uh, founded a copy editing program, which is actually a stealth leadership program, which is now involved into a multimedia leadership program at the University of Nevada, Reno, and an entry level or an entry level management training program that we hold at Northwestern. So as all of you go on in your careers, I hope that you will look to the Maynard Institute for some of your future training. We are open to journalists of all races and ethnicities. And to learn more about us, go to our website, which is mije.org, where you can also read uh, Richard Fritz, who is the only journalist who writes about issues of journalism and diversity. And diversity is what we're going to uh, here to talk about today. I'm going to give a brief overview of the Fault Lines Framework, which is our diversity framework. And it was actually um, conceived of by my father. It was the last project we worked on. And it's a framework for both how you conceptualize stories and how you can talk about stories in your news organizations and with sources. My father came to Fault Lines really shortly before he died as he was reflecting back and he was thinking about the social earthquakes that he covered 
in the 1960s when he worked for the Washington Post. And then he was also thinking about the physical earthquakes that he lived with in the Bay Area when he was with the Oakland Tribune. And as he thought about those two things, he realized that as a nation, we're split along the five thought lines of race, class, gender, generation, and geography. And that those five things really shape our perceptions about ourselves, each other, and events around us. And that we need to really come to terms with that. We've spent a lot of time trying to pretend sometimes that we all see things the same way. But really, our thought lines do shape how we see things. And it's natural that we see things differently. And it's natural that two people can look at the same thing and see something completely different. The first time I was working with thought lines, and this happened to me, I was at a, a prayer institute conference on race in the media. And in the course of the conference, we were looking at an old clip from Ted Koppel's Nightline, where he was interviewing two residents from a Philadelphia neighborhood, or I think two or three residents. And they were very clear. They were white residents, and they didn't want black people moving into their neighborhood. And they were absolutely clear about why they didn't want this to happen. They said, you know, black people move in, property prices plummet, and crime skyrockets. And I kept expecting Ted Koppel to sort of interject, you know, some sort of context and say, well, we respect there are African American neighborhoods that are safer and more affluent than some white neighborhoods. That didn't happen. And so when the discussion occurred around this trip, I raised my hand to say that you know it was missing that context. It was a big, big uh, conference. And I guess I had some other point to make because they kind of ignored me. And then about five minutes later, a white male participant raised his hand, and he said that he was concerned about context. And he was concerned that without context, that clip made all white people look as if they were racist. So we, there we were. We saw the exact same clip. We had the exact same concern with context. But because of our fault lines differences, what we meant by context was completely different. Now, I have no idea what he really meant because they ignored him. Shoot. <laughs> but I would have liked to know that. I don't know if I would have come to agree with him, but one of the things that we urge people to do with fault lines is to have conversations where you don't try to agree with the other person, but you try to understand why they have this point of view. And this is particularly important for us as we're trying to craft our coverage and trying to help the country understand where we are. Because right now what we have for the most part, are, we have two people with different opinions, and we see them pitted against each other. And so really what we see is that they, we see them sort of getting more and more stuck in their position. And what we're trying to do with Fault Lines is help people understand what's beneath the surface. What is, why do you have that position? And we probably, when you take out the need to agree, you take out the need to be right. And that allows people a little more flexibility. Because, you know, if you look at some of the areas where we've seen this recently, like uh, this when Skip Gates was arrested by the Cambridge police, and there was a lot of, no, he shouldn't have been arrested. Yes, he should have been arrested. If he was wrong. They were wrong. You know, you could talk to me until you're blue in the face, and I'm still probably never going to think that he should have been arrested. But I would be curious to understand why you really think, he, why that was a viable option for the police to take. And that would teach me, and that would teach the country a lot more, not only about our views of the criminal justice system, but our experiences with it, our community's experience with it. And that would be a lot more helpful than this yes, no, which is where we are now. So we really urge people to, to dig in. And I'm, you know, I'm from New York, so I'm not terribly sensitive. So when we first started thinking about this idea, it's like, really? Because <laughs> I think it's OK if you just agree with me. But I've actually tried it. It works. And I've learned a lot more about other opinions and other communities than I would have otherwise. So really digging in does make a difference. The other thing we urge people to do is to not blur the fault lines. If we're going to have honest and open conversations, we need to make sure that we're not speaking in coded language. And right now, one of the ways we try to sort of skirt these conversations is by blurring the fault lines 
using geography as codes for race and class. So we'll say, oh, in an urban ministry. So what do we mean? Mm -hmm. Poor, black, maybe Latino. In the, by the, uh, in contrast, if we say it was in a suburban community, it's usually white, upper middle class, middle class. <clears throat> and not only are we not really speaking directly, we're also inaccurate. A lot of times, I mean, you look at Oakland, which is one of the most diverse communities in the country. Uh, you look at suburbs, which the census showed us 42% of African Americans live in the suburbs. So it's just not accurate. As opposed to it also helps us not have the conversations that we need to be having. And we also urge people to know what thought line is at play. Again, because we're not good at having these conversations, a lot of times we glom onto the most obvious fault line, and then we, we go with that. So this goes back many years. It was uh, uh, the Oakland School District wanted to teach its students in something called Ebonics, Black English. And it created an absolute uproar. And a couple of years after that, I, I was taking a class at, the, at Berkeley magazine writing class. I was the only person over 28, the only person of color in the class. And the story I wanted to do was a sort of retrospect of the media's coverage of the bodies. Because the media covered it really as an issue of race, when it was, in my opinion, an issue of class within a race. And so, and that, that actually really made much more sense for me. It made the coverage much, made much more sense. But in any case, I was sort of outlining the story and uh, one of the young women in the course got very excited about the issue of class in the African American community, something she hadn't really thought about, and uh, wanted to explore it. And as you people will do, you young people, generational, generational blind spot there, but in any case, <laughs> uh, she had, the night before, she had been watching one of those E True Bio, whatever they're called, on um, the rapper Ice Tea. And so she just starts launching into how he grew up and where he is and now what's he doing. And then she sort of turns to me and says, so when it comes to class in the African American community, what do you think about iced tea? Uh, well, she was talking tea. to my race. Right, exactly. She was talking to my race, but my generation answered her. I was in my mid-40s, no children, and I didn't really think about iced tea. <laughs> So you need to know what thought lines at play if you're going to have a conversation that makes sense and go beyond just the obvious thought lines. Part of the reason that we think some of this happens is because of what we call blind spots, areas where our five thought lines come together and we don't see something. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to be able to talk across diversity. Because I'm not saying that there's no such thing as racism or sexism or classism or ageism, but sometimes what appears to be that really is a blind spot. You just didn't see it. You know, when I first started working on thought lines and I just moved out to California, uh, Steve Montiel asked me to put together a thought lines advisory group. And I did, and it was, it was quite brilliant. It had everybody covered older people, younger people, suburban people. I mean, it was, and he took one look at it and he said, well, where are the Asian and the Latino representatives? And, you know, it wasn't that I had been trying to leave anybody out, but I came from New York where, particularly back in the 90s, when you talked about race, you talked about in terms of black and white. I simply didn't see it. You know, would I make that mistake now? No. I make other mistakes now. But that is why you need to be able to talk honestly with your colleagues and why you need diversity. So somebody, if you have a blind spot, somebody's able to, to bring that to your attention in a way that isn't so charged. I mean, one of the things we urge people to do, particularly if they know each other and they're in a, you know, in a news organization, when you're at loggerheads over something, instead of walking away or instead of just getting angry, they were people, we've taught people to just say, I think we have a fault lines issue here. And that enables you to sort of step back and think about your perspective while hopefully the person you're talking to is also thinking about their perspective. 
And lastly, when it comes to actually conceiving of the cover, we with fault lines, we think, you know, the way we have who, what, where, when, why, and how, we have race, class, gender, generation, and geography. And so when you're looking at a story, try to figure out how does it look across those five fault lines. And usually when I'm doing this, I'll break it up into five groups and we'll look at one story from different fault line perspectives, but we don't really have time to do that. So one of the stories that I thought cried out for better fault lines in the concept conceiving of the story was the election of Barack Obama, which, you know, a year ago was a very happy thing. And everybody covered, it was largely covered after the election as if it was, and it was, a great milestone for African Americans. And that was sort of a lot of where the story looked at the, the historical impact of what it meant for the African American community. You know, you had stories of people who didn't think they'd live to see it. You had, so that was sort of a generational. You had what it meant to be young. But you know, that was a story that cut across all the fault lines. I was teaching fault lines at Mills College, and a young white woman was telling me what it meant to her older, aging leftist parents. You know, they never thought that they would live to see this day. We had initially stories about the Latino community early on in the election when it was primarily about how Latinos wouldn't vote for Obama. Well, that proved to be wrong, but there weren't stories about what it meant to the Latino community. The Asian community, the Native American community, <coughs> were absolutely invisible. And this despite the fact that Obama had a great deal of support amongst the Native American community. So you really need every story, you just need to think about what does that look like across the fault lines. And then hopefully have people in your news organization or even your sources who can then sort of take, pull your attention to your blind spots. We, uh, when we were doing this in a newsroom in a community that has a very high immigrant, immigrant uh, community, we sent people out into various zip codes and asked the journalists to ask, their, ask the community how could they better be covered. And they came back, one group came back with the, the people obviously didn't talk to the fault lines, the sources didn't, but they talked to, they were sort of giving the fault lines lesson. And they said one of the ways that they can be better covered is that the newspaper can stop referring to them as poor. They said, you know, you look at us and you see two families living in one house, sharing one car, and you call us poor. And we say, we have a house, we have a car, and we are not poor. Now, I think if we don't know how to begin to ask those questions and really communicate with our sources, it's not going to matter what platform the, the journalism that takes place, and it's still not going to be accurate and fair, and people still aren't going to be fully engaged. So we really need to figure out how all of us can go out and use fault lines to better and more accurately cover the totality of our community. I think in 20 minutes is up. So I'd just like to open it up to questions and, and maybe answers. Yeah. <laughs> we have some questions. Yes. Just going back to your last point, I'm wondering, as a reporter, if you're covering a story about a maybe a low-income neighborhood, how how would you do that better? I mean, do you not use the word poor in your copy, and do you just use low income, or you define it as an income bracket? I mean, I understand how the perceptions are mm -hmm. different. What you were saying about having a car, having a house, but it still, I think, is pertinent information for a story, I guess, at least at the income level. Well, you can talk about the income level, and you can describe it. Yeah. But I, I think sometimes just, because, you know, when you say things like poor, it does mean something different to everybody else. So I think if you put the income level and you describe the life, yeah. and um, I think that allows people to fill in their own blanks. A couple of things here. I'd like to start with one that was my own personal experience, and I'm still kind of chafing over. Um, so now we go with ABC News. I was asked to do a story about um, a school in uh, in South LA. It was teaching <coughs> English as a second language to youngsters who had grown up here and born here, not Spanish, mm -hmm. African American, mm -hmm. because the patois that and this is before Ebonics. So it was in the patois of the neighborhood. They could not. 
uh, break out of it uh, to speak standard English. And so they were teaching standard English in this classroom. And uh, so I, went, I was assigned to do this story, and, and we interviewed everybody, and I was in the class with the kids who were great, laughing at my way of talking, and it was a lot of, it was, it was interesting. And the piece never aired, because when I got back to New York, somebody on the editorial ring said, well, we can't have a white woman doing the story. What, what, how do you feel about that sort of thing? I mean, there's sort of this PC, uh, we can't be talking about African-American students <coughs> being given English lessons and told by a white reporter. And I, I just wonder if we're past that or if we're uh, still doing that kind of, it still annoys me to be in there because I thought it was an important story and characters were so. Yeah, I think that's why we, we want to have a deeper discussion because I'm not quite sure. I mean, first of all, ABC News, if you want to have, I mean, then they'd have to change their hiring practices. <laughs> so Not in this case. We, I mean, I was in the LA Bureau, mm -hmm. and, and um, we were fairly diverse at the time. So it was assigned to me because, um, I think, because I'd been a high school English teacher, mm -hmm. and it was a fascinating subject. So I, I'm just wondering. You know, I, no, I think that any, I mean, I, I think that if you have people who are culturally competent, anybody can cover I any story. I, do think, I mean, I, I wonder if they saw something that they thought was a red flag and they didn't know how to say that to you, or, and that's... No, they would say it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was purely, she's the wrong color to do the story. And, uh, so I, it just is always interesting to me. No, I think, uh, I mean, I do think that there are times when people will make mistakes because they, they are having those conversations in their newsrooms and they inadvertently fall into a blind spot. But I think as long as everyone's sort of, you know, doing their job, then yeah, I wouldn't see that as a huge problem. Sure. I wanted to ask you a, a complicated question. Uh, it's based on an <coughs> It's based on an anecdote uh, from a friend of mine from a couple of years ago that's really s stuck with me. So if you, if you look at the issue of diversity in the news media, you can look at it maybe at two or three different levels, right, historically. First, there's the issue of hiring. Okay? So to some degree over the last 30 years, you can say, okay, there's been some progress in that. Then there's the issue of coverage. Okay? Covered, you've covered these communities that uh, were once ignored. Okay? And the answer is, well, yeah, obviously that's better than it used to be. I mean, I think people think the argument that it's somewhat it's better. Yeah, at least somewhat better. But the third level, um, which I think you see in big cities, and I think you see it um, specifically with uh, 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 more uh, Latino, uh, when it comes to Latinos, where you have high concentrations now of Latinos in major cities, is do, and I'm talking about most of the newspapers and uh, electronic media, okay, legacy media, even if they pass those first two bars of hiring and of coverage, my friend that I have in mind argued <coughs> that they still don't treat those communities as actual consumers of the product. They treat them as objects of study. Okay. So, and let themselves off the hook by saying, oh, we did this great series on Latinos, or we did this great series on Asians, but they're looked upon as an exotic species rather than as people who <coughs> want to pick up the LA Times and, and read it. And uh, the, just to lighten the anecdote, the anecdote comes from a young reporter that we both know who uh, Frank knows him as well, who worked at the LA Times, uh, who's a Latino. And he, and a rising star, at age 25, he quit the LA Times. And when I asked him why, he said he was tired of his editors, this is two years ago, he was tired of his editors imposing upon him what he called the comma explainer. That if he used the word, if you refer to a tortilla or to a pupusa, then the the, the, there would have to be a, a comma 
saying a common plate eaten by Salvadorans, right? Rather than understanding that there's a half million Salvadorans who live in Los Angeles and might actually know what a pupusa is. And of course, the funniest thing he said to me was that he wanted to write a story where he referred to pastrami so he could put a comment <laughs> a, a meat-based dish derived from Eastern Europe, right? So that's a very long way of saying, do you, do you think that that was this kid's problem, that this was just a chip he has on his shoulder, or is that real? I mean, do, do, do these news organizations, even after they make uh, the hire, and even after they make the commitment to uh, do the coverage of these communities, do they really consider the people in these communities to be their audience, or are they just objects of study? Well, if they're objects of study. I mean, I, your um, colleague's experience is not unusual. It's why there's a high churn rate of um, young journalists of color, because they get into the industries and are sometimes hired because of the diversity that they're going to bring to the table, right. and then that diversity is not respected or listened to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're told that's not even a story. And, and I don't think we should celebrate the progress that we've made in terms of hiring or content. You know, we're in newspapers, in part because of what's going on, but we're back at um, the diversity levels of 1998, and content often still show that people of color are overrepresented in stories about crime, sports, and entertainment, and underrepresented in all the other stories. So the nuances of my everyday life do not are often not reflected in in the news organizations and in fact that's why some of the sites on the web have started like Jack and Jill Politics. Do any of you read Jack yeah. and Jill Politics? Yeah, I was just talking to Cheryl Conti yesterday who's one of the founders of Jack and Jill and she said that they started it because they continued to view um, every time they looked at the legacy media she felt that the the lives of African Americans were inaccurately portrayed and distorted. So I don't even know what kind of progress we've made. And that really does have huge societal implications because there are all kinds of studies that have shown that because we're such a segregated, we still live in such segregated communities, really the way we learn about each other is through the entertainment and news media. And so not surprisingly, people who don't have uh, direct experience with African Americans or people of color, but who get their information from the news media, are terrified of us. I'd be terrified too. But isn't there, isn't there an aspect of that? And I, I don't have to, it's not real well formed in my head, so I don't know how to articulate that to be about it. But isn't there an aspect of that that um, um, derives, in fact, from the way that the notion of capital D diversity is dealt with by some of these news organizations? sense that, uh, while well, stories about uh, blacks or Latinos are considered for better or for worse to be in a, in a diversity category, mm -hmm. rather than just saying, well, you know what, they just, there just happens to be, you know, a couple of million people in LA County who are Latinos, right? And they, mm -hmm. they might just pick up the, the, the newspaper. And not only do we have to write about them as them sometimes, but them are also interested in all these other things that we do, but we just keep them kind of segregated over here and decide, well, you know, now and then we'll, we'll deal with it as something separate, even in a positive way. Right. Right. Well, that's, that's why we, when we, we talk about fault lines, when you're looking at a story, look at how it cuts across race. So if it's a Father's Day story, <coughs> right. there are black men who, I mean, not in the media betrayal, but there really are black men who take their kids to school and are heads of intact families and went to college. And the same for Latino and Asian, uh, you know, because really it does cut across the board that most people of color are, are invisible. So absolutely, we should be in every story. Gas prices. Just, just death panels. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, again. Okay. Um, one thought I have is, as news organizations are shrinking their local <coughs> news bureaus and are uh, and increasing your making do with smaller <coughs> staffs to cover a wider range of stories and wider levels of stories, I wonder how fault lines then plays out in that shrinking 
organizational system because one could argue and to Mark's point that well maybe what happens is you have a lot of the audience specific stories tend to happen more at a community at a local level, local news and state level news. The more national you get, the more international you get, the more abstract the story gets. Um, so you either have to compensate for that by making it less abstract and bringing in more stories, but that requires a whole, I assume, cultural shift to make that happen, or you have to figure out how you compensate for the loss of <coughs> local voice uh, in this economy. So I, I just well, I mean, I think that you're, you're going to have to do some kind of cultural shift. I mean, clearly, news organizations can't go on the way they're going on because they're not going on very well. Uh, so we need to have a cultural shift. And, you know, there is also, in some places, they are actually focusing more on local news. You know, like they'll contribute much more on local news than international news. And so, but one of the tricks there is that even if you're, you're concentrating on local news, you have to be sure that you're getting outside of one community. And you really have to be vigilant. I mean, I think, and that's where Fault Lines is one of the answers, because it keeps it top of mind. You may not always get it right, but at least you're always thinking about it. And I, and I think that we have to put in place <coughs> more ways for people to be thinking about covering the totality of their community and, in creative and thoughtful ways. And I, and I just think that has to be almost like, you know, I went to a uh, newspaper in, I think it was a Philadelphia Inquirer many years ago, and they had all these signs around about making deadline. It was everywhere. Everywhere you looked, it was all about making deadline. And that's what we need to have, that kind of thing in people's face everywhere about covering their community and making sure that everyone is covered. It just needs to be that intense. Oh, and, and then Sandy, I'll get to you. Um, one thing that I've, we've talked a lot about in relation to online journalism and web journalism is that there's incredible potential for ghettoization, meaning if you have an interest in something, say climate change, you can go just to the websites that are going to tell you what you want to learn about climate change. And I think the same is probably true in terms of ethnic media. And I'm wondering if you could comment about that and how maybe to <coughs> the potential for online journalism to break down those barriers that are happening, say, in the LA Times, like Mark Cooper was talking about. Uh, I think that is a real danger, and if you look every day, there's some new, and I think it's going to get worse, because every day there's some new solution for saving journalism, and none of them mention diversity. And so, unless you're paying that kind of <laughs> vigilant attention to it, you will have a lot of sites like Jack and Jill. I mean, the number of black bloggers has just exploded, but who's reading? You know, I mean, it's, now I'm just as guilty, I can't say that I'm on every conservative site either. <laughs> Now there are, I was talking to, to somebody who was talking about sort of new tools of aggregation and smarter searches and how that's going to pull everything together, but the caveat is not unless the people creating the searches are thinking about that. And so unless we really reinvigorate the conversation around diversity, we will just end up in a very polarized, with very polarized media. I mean, we already see it to some extent with, you know, you look at Fox and CNN and who believes that there are weapons of mass destruction and who doesn't. But it's going to get a lot worse, and it's going to cut across all the fault lines, unless, unless we do something. But first, I think it's can uh, A kind of technical question. When we are you gas pricey story. So we go out and get our sample we, everybody in the community. Uh, and now do I, uh, Hispanic uh, last names will identify Hispanics. Uh, easily enough, but an Asian last name is probably going to identify an Asian. But how do I identify that I have sample black? Do I write down comma black as we used to do? No, but you know what? I mean, some of it's uh, you can use pictures because those stories always have pictures, and so you, that's one way. And then the other thing that you'll say it's two it's twofold. It's one is making sure that the rest of the community has an accurate and fair portrayal of various communities they wouldn't otherwise have any contact with, and it's also <coughs> cementing a bond between various communities. So even though maybe uh, so-and-so over there won't know I'm black, but my neighbors will know I was in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so that'll help to sort of 
hopefully reconnect uh, that bond. But I think clever use of pictures is one way. And now Sandy. Um, Dory, I was just wondering if you could maybe tell a couple stories from kind of before and after fault lines when you've gone into a place and you, you've analyzed the coverage, mm -hmm. you know, and you've talked. And, and I know, you know, from talking to you before, you, you said that there's been some resistance occasionally. Mm -hmm. And then and then maybe maybe people make a decision to, to cover, maybe do a big series or whatever it might be. And, and what you see that's changed, and qualitatively and just in terms of content, what sort of differences have you seen? So we've seen differences in how people, two differences. One in how people talk to each other. In the newsroom. Uh, in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And how they're able to get past the, uh, you, know, um, <coughs> you know, just sort of rolling their eyes and walking away. And when they're at news meetings, how they're able to advance stories because they will actually sit back and say, I think this is a fault lines issue. And that is a lot less charged than I think you're an idiot or you just don't get it. <laughs> so that's one big difference. And, that, and what we try to do in newsrooms is really talk to the entire newsroom, you know, in, in small increments, so that when we leave, everybody has at least some of the same, and they have the same language. Uh, what we've also found is people do open up their coverage. So this isn't at a, at a news organization. Well, we had somebody who went through one of our management training programs about a year ago, and we always get fault lines. And when she came back to her newspaper, which was in Texas, there was an ice storm. And her story went across all the fault lines. She talked about what it meant for seniors and Meals, and meals on Wheels, what it meant to be a waitress and, you know, not getting your, you can't go to work, you don't, you don't get paid, um, as well as what it meant for more affluent people. So it really does help people open it up to a wider, um, wider version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dory, what, what accounts for the decline in diversity uh, since, I think, 78, you mentioned? What, what, are, what are the reasons for uh, finding these newsrooms less diverse? I think people are being laid off. They are being bought out. They are leaving. And diversity is no longer uh, a key priority for the industry. I mean, they will. some people will say it is, but I've had a CEO, and this was a couple of years ago, but things weren't as bad as they are now. A CEO of one of the larger newspaper companies tell me, you know, in a private conversation, that not only was diversity not on the front burner, it's not even in the kitchen anymore. So, have the attitude of whites who run these newsrooms has, has it changed vis a vis diversity? Are they, are they tired of it? Are they less inclined to be sympathetic? Are they feeling more entitled about the cultural terrain that they, that they, they that are they They are feeling support? as if diversity, right now they're trying, they're in survival mode and diversity is a luxury they can't afford. Mm -hmm. And it gets back to something Mark said because they don't view these other communities as consumers. So if you really thought that, that you know, survival was the issue, you would be trying to reach out to as many people as possible. But if you don't think that those people over there are news consumers or consumers of goods, <coughs> You're, you're, you're not going to uh, make those inroads. And you can have as many studies as you want that show that African Americans and Latinos uh, pay, uh, spend a disproportionately higher percentage of their uh, income on goods, are more brand loyal. But those are studies. That's an interesting, uh, I mean, there, I, I find there, there's an interesting little nugget of what you say because uh, um, my colleagues know that we spend a lot of time uh, here bringing our hands over business models. Uh, we have no idea what any of them are, but but we know that uh, <laughs> if you do, please tell me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh, that could be a private uh, discussion. But, you know, but, but everybody laments <coughs> the collapse. They kind of ritualistically lament the collapse of the old business <coughs> model. But that old business model was based on, uh, as you well know, as a great degree of targeted advertising, mm -hmm. that uh, where there were, where there are disparate income levels uh, uh, based on race, uh, so that it was more important for the newspaper publisher to have uh, more uh, suburban readers than urban readers, uh, because the advertising space, frankly, is worth more money. 
I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe you could scientifically prove it wasn't, but they, the prevailing notion. Well, that was the prevailing notion. Yes. That it was, and I just, I just, it's not really a question. It's kind of a comment, which is to say, you know, that some of those good old days weren't quite that good. Uh, when you when you look at the way that that business model influenced mm. the sort of coverage that took place, of course, everybody denies it because there's a supposed to firewall. But somehow or another, the zoned issues in the LA, the zoned conditions of the LA Times wound up being zoned out into the suburbs 100 miles away rather than into the inner city. Right, no, uh, absolutely. Yes, Dora, even before the, uh, the current economic collapse, I think you said 1998 that the figures haven't improved right. any as far as employment. Well, they, went, they just dropped back. Okay. But I mean, but, but it's like by a fraction So by percent. 1998, I think uh, we were seeing, and I'm just wondering what, what you mm -hmm. sense, was there kind of a, like a diversity fatigue? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, what was that? Because now they can say it's the economy. <coughs> but, but I think right. you can show that even before the economy, that uh, diversity as something that was, that was valued by management had, had uh, declined. Oh, absolutely. And, and at that point, it was, well, we tried. We tried everything. And it didn't work. It's like, yeah, but you know what? You're trying to increase readership, and it's not working, and you're not giving up. Right. So it, it was, and I think that there was also, I think that part of it was that all the white male executives who pretty much were running the companies felt like they never got any credit for anything they did do. So it was kind of like, well, all right. I don't need to worry about any of it anyway. But yeah, 98 by definitely diversity. Too. And when we talk about diversity, though, I mean, when you look back into the, when I started at the LA Times, I mean, there was one female reporter on the Metro staff, but diversity also means obviously uh, female mm -hmm. staff, mm -hmm. and and how is that uh, how is that done, and and how are some of the other kind of uh, diverse uh, uh, elements of the of the newsroom uh, pop population done uh, in addition to to race? I think according to the Women's Media Center, less. About three percent of the decision makers in media are women, so not so good. Right. And though, uh, like you look at the journalism schools and this preponderance of, of female students, I think the last time I saw the the number of uh, females on, on newspapers was about thirty five percent. It had not risen, and mm -hmm. in fact, it looked, had decreased. So that was pretty surprising that it's still not even right. uh, clo anywhere close to half. Yeah. Just following up on that, as an added question to that, how much do you think that ties to the demise of affirmative action as a legitimate uh, policy? And whether in environments where you have legislated quota systems, if you will, or opportunities that push you a little bit further, external pressures, whether that those systems may in fact have a a place in society to, to provide at least a baseline. Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes you do have to legislate, but and, and to some extent, but you know, I think people just are so uncomfortable with the idea of having um, diversity and giving up power, dealing with people you're afraid of, uh, that there will be ways around it no matter what. And, and, and that's why sort of our role is so important because we can help change the way we look at each other. If we do it, if we are more accurate, more thorough, more complete in our coverage, I think that would go a long way to binding us together and to get to begin to diminish the notion of the other. And I think that would be uh, a good first step. I don't know which Judy one. Mueller. No, no, I don't mean I don't mean I don't know you. I mean I don't know which one of you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all these fault lines. And you mentioned geography. Didn't you? I did mention geography uh, because I I sense and I I got a lot of this at ABC too. Um, a real ignorance and and ignoring of rural America. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever look at that? Because I I really. You know, there's always this very dismissive kind of, uh, oh, they live between the two coasts and they're out there right, somewhere the farming the or something. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is a, a 
mean, somebody that comes from a small town, I'm just always appalled at the prejudice. Well, actually, in, in some ways, <coughs> the coverage of small towns is similar to the coverage of people of color. I mean, when I read cover, I mean, I'm terrified of you people out there. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going there. I, I don't know what you eat. I don't know what you think. I don't know. I mean, yeah, no, it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is bad. It really is. I mean, I wouldn't go to Utah. Really? And it's very pretty from what but I can I see when I look down. But I often don't take the exit ramp right. in a strange city that says Martin Luther King Boulevard. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we are. And I, and I say that, and, and by the way, that was a story that was done on ABC News. Mm -hmm. about the Martin Luther King Boulevards across the country mm -hmm. being scenes of high crime. Mm -hmm. right. But it was done by an African American. It was Michelle, Michelle Morris, mm -hmm. actually, and she was still with us. So, and I and I thought, well, that is one you really. I mean, but that. You see, now I live right next to Martin Luther King Boulevard, mm -hmm. and I walk there. But I also know my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, so Oakland's obviously a city of neighborhoods. West Oakland is sort of scary black. East Oakland sort of scary Latino and black. I live in West Oakland. And I know not to believe what I read in the newspaper. Well, my car broke down and I decided because I'm a New Yorker, I'm going to take the bus everywhere. And I had to take the bus over through East Oakland. And then I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to <laughs> Was I thinking? Uh, it was a perfectly fine experience. Nothing like what I read about in the paper. So, yeah. you know, what the media portrayal makes a huge difference. Yes. Um. Getting back to something that, that Mark raised, I mean, you know, if, if, if a newsroom executive or a newspaper makes a decision that says, we've got to diversify our staff and we're going to hire Latinos to cover the Latino community and African Americans to cover the African American community and so on, so that there's a value in that, right, mm -hmm. on one level. But on the other hand, you know, from talking to colleagues over the years, people don't always want to say, well, you know, I want to cover politics of the environment. I mean, What's the interplay and the tension there? So I would hope that they would say we want to we want to hire these people to give us insight into those communities and the voices to be heard while we're crafting coverage. And you know, a diverse viewpoint can give you a diverse viewpoint on the environment. You know, on politics. So it doesn't need to be it doesn't mean that you need to be relegated to covering your community, but that your voice does need to be heard when discussing your community. So that you know, if, if I'd worked in newsrooms with Judy, then I wouldn't be so afraid of Utah. Or, you can meet my sister wives. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be lovely, too. But, but you know what I mean? You have, you have that mix going on. And so that's what I think is more important than saying you're... And then if people want to cover, and, I mean, that's fine, too. But how much is that a phenomenon to you that you're aware of that people think they're, they're pegged, they're pigeonholed? Sure, in absolutely. How much is that going on in, in now to, uh, in your experience? It, it does still happen. I mean, I think, though, that also people are so concerned about the way communities are being covered. And that's what also happens sometimes. Is people look at, this is not my community. That, I mean, my community doesn't look anything like what I'm seeing in the, in the mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. And so then that can propel people to try to at least uh, balance that coverage. So it can cut both ways. Mm -hmm. Hey, I had a question for you, just how was it growing up under two pioneering black journalists? Did you feel pressure to uphold their mission? It was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> high energy, high maintenance. But it was not boring. There was, I mean, conversations were, were fabulous. And uh, pressure to uphold their mission. Well, I was the oldest and the only girl. So the boys got a free ride. <laughs> they, they could do whatever they want. Actually, my father did have odd, but that's a whole other time. Do you ever get diversity exhaustion? Do you ever feel like, uh, gosh, I inherited this uh, African-American uh, legacy, uh, and maybe I'd like to be something else, or, or kind of be defined or define myself in other terms of profession? Um, no. Uh, no, because I grew up in, in a very diverse household, diverse situation, so it comes to me naturally. And I am always fascinated by um, not, not only differences, but also as, as much as I do the work, how many dumb mistakes I can make. And, you know, I mean, things that just come out of my mouth and I'm like, really? Because I do this work all the time. Mm -hmm. So 
So it gives me more compassion for people, too. And it's interesting to watch the evolution of people, you know, I think trying to learn more about each other. Do you think your, your, your understanding of your own blackness is, is very distinct from that of your parents? Who there's another, another era and trying to another moment? Sure, absolutely. And, my, and how so? Um, they <coughs> were much more hyper vigilant about everything. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, well, some of you might never heard of my father, but in any case, he was very elegant. I mean, they were, their clothing was their armor. You know, their fabrics, literally their fabrics were their armor. Don't you think, Frank? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They felt they could not make a mistake as being the first or one right. of the and, person in the business. And, you know, uh, they just they had to be impeccable at every moment because first impressions, that's how you're judged. You know, and they would see me sometimes walk in the You were looking more relaxed and a little snubby. <laughs> it wasn't always greeted with more than happiness in my household. Now, an interesting, my youngest brother, who is 21 years younger than I am, so I went to the convention, saw Obama give his speech. It was amazing to me. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And I get home, and Alex is like, I'm, I'm trying to show him something on, on YouTube, and he's showing me some stupid athlete's trick, and I'm like, what, what, what? Yeah. And he's like, oh, Jesse Jackson already did that. Yeah. And that was that. You know, so I mean, I think generationally, we always look at things very differently. But the, that, so the, this kind of stridency is, is relaxing, or, or less? Yeah, yeah, at least in our family. I mean, it, I think David's maybe a little more on the hype of it. And Alex is just very relaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorian, I'm sorry, I came in late, so I don't know if you touched on the issue of how, in the new digital ecology, how social media has the potential to, to really bring in so many voices that haven't been heard before, and and then how can it be abused as well as well? And is it and is it bringing in voices? It can't. It can, but you have to listen to them. Or you have to be where the conversation is. Right. And so, you know, I don't know, have you all seen the Dana Boyd study that looked at Facebook and, and MySpace and found that, uh, you know, she was looking at teenagers, but found that as you know, there was a big migration to Facebook away from MySpace, which she really white viewed flight. as white flight, absolutely. Hmm. And white flight from MySpace. Yeah. Right, and she had people being quoted as saying, my space is so ghetto. Right. Okay, well, that's, that's conventionalism. I mean, that's more than just a... Just, just her study. That seeped into the popular culture, and it might be, uh, there might be a truth to that, 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 that uh, white people did flee my space as more and more blacks. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also something that popped up, bubbled up. It's not an academic study yet, but there was... Uh, a, uh, there was a spike of, uh, of uh, discussion in the blogosphere last week. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was based on any scientific uh, or academic research, but there was uh, a lot of traffic last week about uh, uh, the notion that there is a huge uh, African American presence on Twitter, yeah, the Twitter but at night. And that white, that there, you actually see that Twitter is dominated by, by whites uh, in the daytime, but that if you look at trending topics at night, uh, that actually there's a huge black presence at, at night. Uh, I, nobody knows if that's true or, well, or, or why that is. Apparently there's anecdotal evidence that it is true. And there's anecdotal evidence that there is a, a, a Twitter division just like there's the MySpace Facebook division. So I don't know that social media is the answer. I mean, I, again, it, I, I, I guess I disagree. I think if it's used, I think if, if, if the strategy is used to think of it as a true way to to involve voices, and especially with news organizations, I'm not, you know, 
where there is a tool. You see, it only is a tool, but also having a sense of, as when we talked about going where the conversation is. Mm -hmm. I, I think so, that... Particularly with mobile now. Yeah, any of these things can be, if, if there is, and, and this was something I was talking about earlier, if there is a concerted effort to include diversity. If not, I think we're going to end up in some ways in a worse place than we were before because we're going to be much more polarized and we're going to be much more involved in our individual discussions. Yes, Erna. Hello, Erna. Sorry, um, I think there's a possibility with social media, but I think as Dory said, there has to be an awareness. For example, when the Obama campaign, I started looking at different blogs because you can read these stories about you know something trending with him. And then I particularly started thinking about was he was uh, he didn't go to the state of the black America. Oh, Tavis. The yeah. Tavis yeah. That was supposed to be so bad. But if you actually went on sites where black people were talking, they were like, well, no, we don't care if he doesn't go. He needs to go get the white folks. And I was thinking that if people had that in their Rolodex, when you talk about the rainbow Rolodex, we don't have rainbow bookmarks. I mean, it's interesting <coughs> how much people will speak pretty freely in a blog in a, in a way that you know they might not even talk to you in person. So that you get something that counter sort of counters this sort of prevailing themes or narratives you see in the mainstream media. But first, you have to know to think to go there. Right. Exactly. And most people are. Uh, it doesn't seem to be seem to be happening. No, I talked to somebody who studies, not here, but studies business models and you know new media business models. And I was like, oh, what about Jack and Jill? And he's like, oh, can you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think he was going to Jack and Jill. So, so Dory, I mean, understanding the sort of principles mm -hmm. of, of, of fault lines, how would you suggest in a, in a real sort of structural, practical way that we bring it into the classroom here? Uh, I think that you, well, first of all, we're going to be doing a fault lines um, manual that's going to be online starting, oh. it'll be yeah. serialized. So that's, that's yeah. one way. And I think um, giving a, a fault lines overview and then exp really expecting your students to, when they cover the stories, really cover them across the fault lines. Get them in the habit now. And so that when they go out, it's just second nature. So, Dora, maybe you can tell us, I mean, you think about the five W's. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing a story, this is for the benefit of the, for the students. Mm -hmm. So what are the checkpoints? I mean, not, not that you didn't want to well, it is. It's, it's, you, you don't want to do it by rote, but, but you know, initially, well, when you have to be conscious of so whether you say, do we have people of different ages? Do we have people of what ages? Right. You know, how does this look across race? How does this look across class? How does it look across gender and generation and geography? And just, you know, constantly making, because if you think about it, geography, then you will be getting out of your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about um, age, I hope you'll think not only, oh, okay, young people, but also how does this affect older people and middle-aged people. Uh, with class, what does this look like across incomes? And with class, we really do try to stick to income levels. Uh, gender, and gender is um, straight male, straight female, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. <coughs> what does it mean across those? And, and then race. You know, do we have people of different races, or are we just defaulting on the same white males? Yes. What about uh, multiracial communities and individuals? Where do they, I mean, well, that's a lot of fault lines all coming together. Mm -hmm. How would you treat someone who has, uh, you know, black parent, one black parent, one descendant parent, but also has a lineage of Native American and Asian American, and uh, it may not look anything like any of those ethnicities, mm -hmm. and has a last name that does not identify them in any particular way, um, and yet they feel that they are a distinct category mm -hmm. from all the other races. Well, that, that's kind of a generational shift, and I think you have to um, have a biracial category or multiracial category when you're thinking. Because, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, it didn't really, that just wasn't an issue. But the numbers of uh, mixed race children have grown, the combinations have grown, it's no longer just black and white, it's, you know, really a rainbow. And I think that, that that's a generational shift I need to make too. So race would include multi 
racial as well. Yes? Um, you brought up just now the issue of groups being more and more separated and just speaking amongst their own groups, especially um, with reference to social media. And also the idea of having sort of rainbow of bookmarks. But what's the media's role? Do you see, especially with social media, is there a way that you can foresee a bridging of these different social media closed networks almost that aren't interacting as much as there was? I mean, somebody was talking about it yesterday. It's a little, I mean, the hope is that, that people will begin aggregating and search engines and and starting and creating some tools that will enable people to talk outside of their networks. That's that's the hope. Yeah, I'm just a bit concerned about like how far can media go with diversity? I mean, we are not talking about bi-racial or multi-racial, but we cannot even cover all these races just in Los Angeles. We are talking about like there are Persians, Indians, Arabs, and within these groups there are Sunni, Shia, so like how far can we? I mean, if you have people who, that's why having people on your staff who really understand it. I mean, you can cover it in depth and, and, and with some uh, nuance, but you need to have the people on the staff who are culturally competent enough to know where to look and how to describe it. But there's no reason why it couldn't be there. Um, I wanted to let folks know that about a year ago, Ricky Porter teamed with Dory uh, to produce an excellent two-day conference, Total Community Coverage. Which is now archived on the Night Visual Media Center website, now <laughs> available to all. <laughs> An extended conversation of some of the issues that uh, have been touched on today. Superb conference with case studies, um, very thoughtful conversation from 20-some-odd journalists from around the country. Yeah, excellent. About half of whom are still employed. Yeah. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Dory.